Freelancers, small business owners, consultants, and solopreneurs. Some people are just drawn to working for themselves. I'm Owen Roth. In this show, I have conversations with self-employed folks about their career journeys. Welcome to the Boss's Path Podcast. And here we go. Today, I'm joined by April Hall Cutting, owner and baker at Wild Yeast Bakery here in Corvallis, Oregon. April, thanks for being here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do at Wild Yeast? I am the one of the founding owner with my husband uh, of this bakery. Started out in our home uh, ten years ago, uh, just having a wild idea that we would like to move into bread baking, join the artisan and sourdough bread movement that was emerging at that time, and so we learned to bake this style of sourdough bread. We'd always baked um, yeasted bread at home forever. We were interested in bread. We have friends that are great bakers. So we evolved that into a little business. And 10 years later, we're in a much larger facility. And now I don't do as much hands-on baking. Um, I advise, I uh, consult, I help guide product selection which sounds terribly professional, but it's really changed over 10 years what I do. We have 15 employees, and I do a lot of the hiring and supervision. I do uh, quite a bit of marketing, Mm -hmm. and I do the shopping for things like trash bags and supplies. (laughs) So it's from very practical to very administrative level with with, uh, lots of conversation with all of our production staff. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like a fairly natural progression of yeah. going like very hands-on and then kind of yeah. delegating. Yeah, it was hard. It's been, the transition's been tricky mm-hmm. and uh, learning to trust other people to manage and to make decisions and to have ideas and just begin to uh, be more hands-off in terms of product development, um, how marketing, the voice of marketing not being mine uh, online and... Uh, and then trying to build a really positive environment among the staff, because I think that reflects to customers and to each other. People, I want my staff to want to be there. Right. So Yeah, that's yeah. super important, and that plays into everything else, right? Sure. Was that something you had planned as far as, like, starting to delegate? Like, when you started, do you think, I'd, yeah. I'd like to be yeah, we, we didn't imagine we would have this many employees, uh-huh. that it would take this many people to do what we're doing now. Um, when we started, uh, we took classes with the small business development, um, people, uh, through our local community college. And we had to write a multi-year business plan and included gradual growth and eventually moving into our own space and hiring at least one person. So (laughs) we already knew when we were still baking out of our home and had six employees, that that something was wrong with that original picture. We didn't. We weren't smart enough to know what it took. Uh, but uh, being more hands off is fine. It's very frustrating. I'm a pretty creative person. I like working with my hands. I like having ideas, mm-hmm. and um, f- talking to people and thinking of products and enjoying good food. That's the side I really love. And when I have not my hands in the dough. And I see something that I think is not exactly what I would like to be coming out. I have to do internal work to uh, just say, well, that's okay. We're within the parameters. Right. Um, uh, It's been a great joy to see a staff member go from being a home baker to a very serious, committed, long-term staff person, a person who really wants to stay with us. Mm. And, And what that really means is that I'll be able to let go of it in uh, within the year, I hope, really hand off to uh, the key staff people the functions that I've been doing and probably have to hire someone to do some of what I'm doing because nobody else does, you know, what I do. Um, it's not as much fun in some ways. I mean, doing staffing is a lot of work yeah. and a lot of responsibility. Um, and conflict can be a challenge. But... Uh, my uh, team of the, the four of us that are kind of the management team, we all have different styles and we all can do different positive contributions to a conflicted situation. And that's really helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do have a lot of questions about the bakery and the evolution. But um, 
you, you kind of alluded to how you got your start commercially baking 10 mm-hmm. years ago. Could we go back even further and you could, could you tell us about just your general, I know a little bit about your, okay. your past prior to that, your working past. Could you share from maybe the beginning and jump oh, through all the from steps? From the beginning. Let's see. <laughs> so I, uh, trained as a musician in college. I always, I played, um, string instruments and, um, my husband actually has a degree in theater. So that eminently qualifies us to be bakers, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the 70s, and the, you know, the whole foods, healthy foods movement was alive and well, and um, we were a part of that. Um, and um, when we uh, got married uh, in Portland, we were living in households that shopped at the food co-ops there and volunteered at the food co-ops and Mm -hmm. um, baked a lot of food from scratch. So that's just part of who we were. Um, We got married, and of all the things we did, we continued to bake bread. Um, Well, after a while, you don't like store-bought bread. You know, it's it's just soft. (laughs) Sure. Not not as much flavor. And the theory is that it might be cheaper to bake it yourself. I think if you're baking it at home and not charging for your labor, it probably is cheaper to bake your own bread at home. Uh, A lot of labor involved. Yeah. So um, our our vocational path led uh, various directions. Um, He decided to enter the pastoral ministry um, after a couple years. And I was very focused on camp and retreat ministries, primarily in the church uh, environment. Mm. Um, both of us were raised in uh, families. Our parents were clergy. And so we, I f- kind of said, well, I'm going to do this outside the church. I'm going to go to camp instead of being in, in the local church. But he mm. had decided that he was going to be a local church pastor. Mm. We went to graduate school together, seminary in Berkeley, California. Um, we're pretty uh, progressive and leftist, and that's the theology, the uh, academic and intellectual theology, mm-hmm. and um, just really enjoyed pushing our uh, boundaries and our and our brains. Um, we had both our children while we were in graduate school, which is totally crazy, but uh, doable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we took our first uh, we first landed in. Pocatello, Idaho, after um, after seminary, um, our church Methodist regional conference encompasses Oregon and Idaho, and so far eastern Idaho is where we started. Okay. And uh, we, Craig and I, also had an agreement that we would alternate being the breadwinner. This is part of our commitment to marital equality. Yeah. So he took that uh, position as a pa- assist- associate pastor mm-hmm. um, to get his. Uh, ministerial credentials and and do work. I raised the kids, but I also worked part time as a musician in the church, and um, and I volunteered at some other activities in the community. And then uh, after four years, uh, it was time for a job change up, so I began to look for work, and I found a job as a full time year round camp and retreat center director in the Hudson Valley of New York. Oh, wow. I would have rather stayed out west. Yeah, um, I'm an Oregon girl by native birth, but that's where the job was. And so we sure. went out to this gorgeous area in New York. Um, and, of course, the idea was that I was going to work full time and he was going to take care of the kids, right? Well, he couldn't stay away from working, and he actually served two tiny little rural churches in, uh, oh. in, in New York. Quarter time, two churches. Don't ask me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, he, it was very effective ministry for him. It was very uh, effective for me, but a very difficult job. This was a huge job to run a year-round retreat center. Um, the finances were always a challenge, and the people, um, very diverse. I had a big learning curve about urban New York diversity, and it, it was good, but four years was enough of that. And so then yeah. we told... Our friends in Oregon, I know, we were ready to come home, and he was appointed to a church in Hermiston, Oregon. So we were still out east. I was still trying to get back to the Lambert Valley, but we were in Hermiston for eight years. Okay. And during that time, I did some part-time paid work for our camping program, some volunteer work for our camping program, and I worked as a substitute teacher, a violin teacher, and a symphony musician. 
Wow. <laughs> so I did, at the same time? Uh, or? Yeah, because they're all a little part-time, right? Oh, okay. So um, for a while, I volunteered with that Eastern Oregon Symphony. And then for a little while, I was a principal and got a very small stipend. But they were trying to, you know, lift up the orchestra. Mm-hmm. Um, that was pretty fun. Uh, again, playing music in the church. And uh, that was not paid, I don't think. Um, but still, it was. But still. still and then, but volu- being a substitute school teacher, uh, most districts need emergency subs because there just aren't enough. Right. And so I uh, gradually worked more and more. And one of the, because I was a musician, the music teachers liked to ask for me to be their sub because I could actually teach the music curriculum rather than just putting a video on. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, my, my daughter's local elementary school, every year the classes put on a little musical, the same one every year. But I learned all of those, and I practiced with the choirs accompanying them. Mm. And so when the teacher was absent, I could carry on the rehearsals. So I, I felt valuable and valued. Yeah, I'm sure you were. Yeah. Yeah. And the high school band students, now that's a whole nother story. But it was great. My daughters were both in band, and uh, so it was their friends. And Yeah. Um, uh, then I the violin teaching came up. By request, people heard that I played, and they started asking me. I became a certified Suzuki violin teacher for four or five years and uh, reached my limit with that about the time we were moving. And at that time, I also uh, realized I wasn't working in camping, but I was spending a lot of time in the local church. So I moved into pastoral ministry finally after all those years of not doing it. And this is still in Hermerson? Still in Hermerson as I began to do the discernment to go that direction with my vocation. Mm -hmm. And so when we moved, uh, Craig was appointed to the Albany Church, Methodist Church, and uh, I... Albany, Oregon. Albany, Oregon, United Methodist Methodist Church, right? And uh, I made myself available to the uh, church folks and said, if you want to send me to a small church somewhere, I'd take that as a lay pastor while I'm going through the process toward ordination. So um, it's very complicated in our church. It takes many years to get fully ordained, but um, I had, you know, I had my seminary degree from um, however many years before it was, uh, uh, 15 years, and I just had to do two classes to finish the credentials for ordination and uh, had a great time. I served the uh, little United Methodist Church up in Sweet Home, Oregon. And we had a fantastic time. Um, it wasn't all smooth, but the rough parts really bonded us together. Yeah. And uh, in 10 years, we did a very, very effective ministry. They're still feeding the hungry people in that town. That was the, their call to really focus on reaching into their community. And then the very last year of that, uh, 2012, 2013, I also served Two churches, one in Harrisburg and one in Halsey. So I had a three-way appointment that year, and I was helping all those churches try to figure out what to do with their futures because they're very small. Yeah, struggling, rural struggling communities. financially. F- great spirit in all those little churches. That's one thing that's tricky. You got a big administration, and you got these little churches that are very vital. So how do they stay part of the big system when they're so little? Well, all those churches are, uh, the two little churches, uh, United in Halsey and Harrisburg, um, and uh, the Sweet Homes still out there kicking. So, you know, they're good. But I needed to do something else. So in in 2013, we started this business. We sat down and said, well, now what am I going to, what's April going to do now? Ready to be done with that pastoral ministry. What am I going to do now? And we said, here's this book about bread and Here's our friend doing it, and here's all these things that are going on. Because, I, you see, it was earlier we had learned about all the grain movement. And so right. this was all just sort of leading us. And we said, well, heck, let's start a bakery. Yeah. Just like that. Let's learn to do that. And uh, so we were a little naive, but, you know, I'm creative and determined. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, I was um, 59, so still young, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh we said, well, we could, we could do this. We could do this for a few years. And I and, uh, had a group of friends that suggested the community-supported model, which means like a CSA farm mm. where you pay ahead for your share of food and you get deliveries every week. They said, well, you could do that with the bakery. People could pay ahead and you deliver bread every week. 
Yeah. Said, well, that sounds like a great model. Discovered that other bakeries were doing that okay. all around the world. Um, and so we went with that, started very small with a few of our neighbors right there at Coho Eco Village. And then we began selling at a small farm stand and just we took subscriptions and subscribers. And then in 2014, we did a pretty firm launch. And during this time, we were taking those classes at SBDC to learn a little bit more about business. Mm -hmm. So business background, well, church business is a kind of business, but it's different than the kind you're in now. The kind we're in now, yeah, yeah. Uh, retail uh, and yeah. and wholesale business is it different. So you're still doing marketing, and a you know, church doesn't like to call it marketing, but you're you're trying to attract people. You're trying to let people know your mission. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that's the same. Yeah. Um, our people values are really important in what we do in our business as a bakery. Mm -hmm. um, we sometimes wish we were a little smarter in terms of business training, but you know, we're learning on the job. Every yeah. day we learn. I feel like that's every business, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we're in those early business classes, they have books that say, okay, you want to go into business? Well, find one. Mm. And so that wasn't our approach. We were of the school of here's our hobby or here's our interests that we really want to pursue. How do we turn it into a business? And um, any business person will tell you that's harder to do. Because you're too close to the thing you want to do. I was going to say, I can relate strongly to that one with my business mm -hmm. being stemming from a hobby. Yeah. yeah. And how do you turn it into something that actually pays your living? Right. And, um, and so, so that was something you were pretty cognizant of even before people told you that? Or did you yeah. had you put that? It was obvious together? Yeah. from day one that yeah. we were doing this for fun. And heck, we could sell a few loaves of bread. Sure. And because it was after school, we should have some cookies for the kids. <laughs> you know, uh, distribution. And it was yeah. like, okay, wh when does this become? It became very different when we actually started with 24 to 48 subscribers every two days every week and going to farmer's market. You know, that became very different when you had the responsibility to get the thing to the consumer. Like a commitment. Yeah, I wasn't just making bread for fun. Right, yeah. Uh, it was still fun, but it was... Very different. Yeah, the circumstances change. Very different kind of performance art <laughs> than music. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, on the other hand, uh, really for us, after those 30 years in church-related ministry, it was kind of a relief to do something that was so hands-on and so practical, and it meant what it was, you know? Um, your spiritual life is full of a lot of metaphor and symbolism, and I, I say, oh, I'm just baking the bread now, you know. I'm not making anything more of it. I did that for years as a pastor. Now it's just bread. I'm going to make the bread. You can do with it what you want, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So, um, and people are pretty excited about it. Um, when you're a pastor, people come to you with some troubles, some excitements. But, you know, you're on call for people in need. Yeah. But the bread... Yeah, you might be serving people in need, but people are pretty happy to be eating your product. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially when it tastes good like yours yeah. does. Yeah, and we do with our um, with our uh, bread that uh, doesn't sell at the co-op; it goes directly to the food bank. Um, we take um, baguettes are very short lived, so we often are walking baguettes or small flatbreads that are left at the end of the day across the street to our homeless neighbors who are right there across from our bakery in uh, one of the camping areas in, in town town. Yeah. So, so it goes to waste. That's great. Uh, yeah. So tell me a little bit about uh, the brick and mortar bakery that you guys recently opened and what that process was like. I know there's some uh, bumps in the road there. Yeah, well, it was a challenge um, because it was always in our um, business plan to move into a brick and mortar. I think the original dream plan was we would do that at about 2017. So we thought it would take us about four years to get to either a shared kitchen or a freestanding bakery. Mm -hmm. Well, in about 2018, <laughs> we got to the point where we started looking at spaces or at least wondering about storefronts that were available. Mm -hmm. And um, in, the sp in May of 2018... I guess we started really looking in 2016 and 17. And when I mean looking, I mean just looking. 
Like driving by something and saying, hmm, would that space work? Yeah. Because we knew nothing. We knew nothing about real estate. We did have help from the um, Small Business Development Center mentors who we worked with. Uh, once you're in those, take take a side trip. Once you're in the SBDC classes, they provide free mentoring as long as you're staying working your business plan that you developed for them. So we we had mentorship all the way up through 2020 um, wow. from the SBDC. So it was great. So we met with one of our teachers to talk about how do you find real estate? How do you do this? We don't know. Yeah. You know, get appointed to a church. It's already there. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right, right. I don't have to decide that uh, unless you're starting a new one, but we weren't. So um, we started looking and thinking, uh, called together a group of our friends, community-based, uh, coho-based um, people in business that asked us hard questions and supported us. And then one day in May of 2018, one of our neighbors was walking uh, downtown from South Carvallis, and she saw that this old, the old Pepsi building on the corner of Second and B had a sign. There was something was going on. It had been left ramshackle for years, and all of a sudden, something was changing. Some trees had been cleared, and there was a for lease sign in the window with a little drawing of a. Uh, restaurant in part of this new development they were doing and we scratched our heads and she says you got to call them so we called that phone number and it turned out it was uh ken pastega of the well-known pastega family here in corvallis and um we met with him just to kind of find out what he was thinking and we talked about coffee shops and we talked about restaurants and what we were trying to do then we went on about our lives and then we kept looking we looked at another restaurant that was uh thinking about selling uh going out of business and making their property available or maybe we were going to share the property it's kind of a vague conversation yeah. and then we said maybe we should just look at an empty building and think about what an empty building would cost uh -huh. we talked to another bakery in town that was uh, perhaps making themselves available to be bought. So we had several different scenarios we were looking at. It was, it was a lot, and we went slow. And this, this uh, group of colleagues that helped us sort through stuff came up with all sorts of strategies we didn't know anything about, how to look at numbers and, and projections. Got a lot of help from, from those folks. And in the end, we decided that building a new facility, even in an empty shell, well, would give us what we wanted better than trying to move into someone's bakery. One bakery we were looking at, we would have had to replace all the main equipment mm. to do what we wanted to do because it was a different kind of bakery. Right. So that was like, well, that's not much cheaper, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Plus you would have had to change the retail side to be what we wanted. So yeah. the numbers just kept coming out kind of the same no matter which scenario we followed. And so... Um, then there was COVID, which brought everything to a crazy pause. Now, we did not, we lost some money, but our baking only got bigger. We had to cancel the in-person classes we teach during COVID. But people seemed to still want to eat during COVID. In fact, they ate a lot during COVID. Yeah. So our sales increased. Um, but... But then we were also in the midst of talking about doing that building. And as you probably know, the supply chain problems for construction materials and all that okay. interfered with that. Yeah. So we actually signed our design contract in January of 2021. So we were in that process during COVID. Um, and Ken Pastega said, you guys still interested in this space? And we thought about it and said, sure. So we took an uh, option on that space and did the design and build, and it just took longer and longer and longer. We couldn't get this. And the last thing that held us up was trying to get our walk-in cooler installed because, of course, you knew that you couldn't get insulation for walk-in coolers during COVID, right? Oh, yeah, everyone knew that. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. So... The the everything was in the counter the counters were in the oven had been installed by the guys from the Midwest and Italy had built our oven in place and the, the 
espresso machine was there and our mixers had come, but we didn't have a walk-in. And we uh, had to have a walk-in yeah. to do this larger production because we hold bread, we hold shaped loaves, we hold dough in the walk-in. Right, yeah, it's we essential process part. It. Yeah. Plus, we have all this bigger amount of um, foodstuffs that we have to get cold. Mm-hmm. So there was just really, it just seemed so long. And this is where we were able to say to the um, the city that we we lost money because we couldn't make the leap. We lost anticipated income because we could have moved a year earlier if we hadn't had the COVID pause. Right. And so um, finally it all got done. And we went from being in our house one day to being in that building the next day um, baking. <laughs> and uh, so... Um, Must have been an interesting transition. It was interesting. We had been looking... Um, to try to find a spot in South Corvallis because we're South Towners and we really want to invest in that part of town. We'd been involved in a South Town development conversations and it just, it, South Town has some challenges and some struggles and actually a couple of the spaces we looked at were taken by other businesses while we were still exploring. Mm-hmm. So we got as close to South Corvallis as we could by being in this historic Pepsi building, which is on B Street, which is the last street before the Mary's River. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we face South Town, and uh, it's um, by car, it's 1.3 miles from our house, but by walking or biking, it's just a mile. You have to do an extra third of a mile because of the streets. Right. But uh, there's the, the pedestrian and bike bridge that comes over right there out of South Town, mm-hmm. comes right past us on 2nd Street. Yeah. Um, And uh, we put up our sign so you can even see our bakery sign up on our parapet as you take the flyover into South Town on Highway 34. You can see that sign up there. So we're really appealing to the people that are coming from the South. And uh, that's as good as we could do (laughs) to serve South Town. It's a good location in many ways. There's some disadvantages because we're all the way at the bottom of downtown. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're right there at the confluence of the Marys and the Willamette, and um, it's it's a pretty pretty interesting location for lots of reasons. But uh, in terms of the building and how um, Ken Pastega designed the renovation, because it's a historic site, they installed um, roll-up garage doors and a uh, glassed in entryway because that was a warehouse that had three truck bays in that footprint. Mm -hmm. And so in order to sort of honor the historic use of that building, which had been a warehouse, um, they kept that that look a little bit. Okay, so that wasn't a mandatory, like... No, in fact, it looks better than it ever did when it was a warehouse. Yeah, no, it looks fantastic. (laughs) Yeah, it looks So, yeah, and it is all new construction. The historic part is the the higher... uh, Two story ish, one and a half story section on the corner. Right on that on that north. Uh, yeah, and that's east. now the Oregon State University Center for Contemplative Studies uh, practicum place. So there's yoga and meditation and mm-hmm. coursework that's held in that unit. Um, we all share the basement under that uh, part of the building, and then there's uh, another retail shop on the north side of the building. So. Um, we have about half of the square footage. and But what I was going to say about those garage doors, uh-huh. they're open to the sunshine and to the, you know, they're closed, but they, it's like having a glass wall. Yeah. So it makes our it's space feel... South facing too. Which... South facing. It makes our face space feel much bigger. Um, it can get hot. Um, we're about in the hot part where... As the sun gets lower, it starts coming straight in our doors. Yeah. And when our oven's on, it can get a little warm in there. I could <laughs> but, imagine. Yeah. Uh, but not as hot as it got in our house. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's been a challenge. Um, I guess you can get tired of learning, even if you love to learn. <laughs> it's like, more to know. You know, I just don't know enough. Almost every week there's something I just... I just don't know enough and sure. I'd try to get advice or try to read up on it or, you know, look look it up on the interweb yeah. and see if someone can tell you how to how to find or do something or what you need to take care of. And yeah. you'd be surprised, you know, just ordering paper bags is a thing. <laughs> as far as the difficulty of doing that or well, you have to find someone that will sell you paper bags. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> Where are you going to start? You tell me when you need 500 paper bags. I've never had to think of that. So, yeah, I have no idea. 
Well, yeah. we have a local provider, and then we have a regional provider, and, you know, we have a couple of sources. But and that's the other funny thing. I'm, I'm willing to support local businesses to go to local stores to buy things like envelopes and pens and paper and plastic bags and uh, all kinds of little stuff, uh, dish soap and laundry soap. I can buy those at stores here in town. Yeah. I could order them online. Sure. And get them delivered. But one of our suppliers, the shipping costs are sometimes 50% in addition to the bill. Wow. And that's that's killer for a small business. Yeah. But I don't know why their shipping costs are so much higher, but it's a challenge. So um, I've learned to become a smart um, online shopper. I often go straight to the manufacturer of something. Mm-hmm. I ordered uh, $100 worth of something the other day, and they weren't going to charge me any shipping. If I go to the supplier that I can use, they were going to charge me $40 of shipping. That seems like a pretty straightforward choice, you know? Yeah, yeah. So so challenges like that every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and there we sit in, you know, South Carvelis, going to our local stores and coming back with a, this and a that. But that works, you know? Up yeah. to a point. There are things I have to order. That um, Corvallis is not quite big enough to have the restaurant supply store that we'd like. Right. So we go to Salem or Eugene. But we're too busy to go to Salem or Eugene now. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, because that's, that's a big, I mean, that's a two-hour round trip. It is. Alone it is. To, so, to shop. You know, how, how much is my labor worth? Right. Sometimes I want to go somewhere and get out of Dodge. And, yeah, a little escape. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so. Yeah. Um, so that's another reason to retire, you know, maybe sure. I have more time to do that. Yeah. But it seems like uh, throughout your career, the, during the bakery and all of uh, the church stuff you and your husband have been involved in, it seems like you've you've enjoyed the perpetual problem solving and learning and oh, you think? with people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm definitely a type A person. I'm creative. I like problem solving. I like all that stuff. I don't love to shop, but if I have a real clear list... You know, I'll go get it done. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I and, you know, my husband and I are good balance because he likes to sit there and bury himself in the computer and get those details lined up. Uh-huh. And without that person, the creative is just a bunch, basket full of ideas that don't go anywhere. Yeah. Right. Unless I can carry them out myself. And in this business, I run into problems. Sure. Know, I can't do it on myself. Sounds like a good bar- balance then yeah. between the two of you. Sometimes it is, and then we need more help. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 You've, you've been getting that as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When you started at the, the early phases of, of the bakery, you had done it as a hobby where you, you mm-hmm. could just make whatever you wanted for yourselves. Mm-hmm. But when you started having to fulfill orders for people, how did that change what you decided to bake? I'm assuming you would have to make a pretty narrow selection so you weren't baking, you know, Well, half I think a dozen I mentioned things. that I was a creative person. So yes, indeed, yeah. we were baking many kinds of bread. Uh, we were sort of exploring for a while. Yeah, and we we learned um, sourdough baking actually from books um, at first. So we had this book, and it used a method, and we had this book, and it used a slightly different method. Mm. But we continued to do both of those things, and they're like a little bit different, but mostly the same. So we're we making s- concurrent. Different types, or you yeah, kind of well, it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> there are some still to this day some differences, but um, but it all was good. So then we went variations, uh, and sometimes we accidentally created a kind of bread. We thought we were following a recipe, and we went back two years later and said, "I didn't make that bread right, but this is great what we are making." Yeah. So, so uh, we have enough experience that uh, once we learn how to manage sourdough. Um, we had a lot of liberty, um, developed new flavors. Uh, one of our specialty breads, which uh, is our country sourdough with dried cranberries and fresh car- fresh ground cardamom in it, our cranberry cardamom bed. It's fantastic. I love it. And I developed that recipe myself. So, you know, yeah. we have some things that are unique to us. Yeah. And, um, and it's just we have about 30 kinds of bread. But you're right. As we began to have a broader reach, I guess I'll say, um, it became important to have sort of the 
principal kinds of bread. Mm. So we're most known for our Oregon country sourdough. Um, most of the bread, most of the grain is grown in Oregon mm -hmm. and milled in Oregon. Um, so rather than just a country sourdough, ours is Oregon country. And that's our, we make the most of that. And then uh, our 100% whole wheat sourdough. Now, 100% whole wheat bread is difficult to find. It's tricky to make. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things we've learned about using locally grown grain is that the um, year to year, field to field, climate to climate, soil, soil differences, a different field can give you a very different wheat than this one. They can be different. So we have to watch carefully when we get from the mill what lot it's from. And when the lot number changes, you know, with the new batch of wheat, we have to be very careful because it might act different. Yeah. And then we have to adjust our recipe and our process. Oh, so, so there's like a whole research and development side of it. Yeah. Things kind of uh, it's very scientific. Yeah. Um, it's really, you know, chemistry. Food is chemistry. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, but we re with working with whole grains, that is the big challenge. Mm -hmm. One of the easy things about making white bread is that white flour is staple. It It's very predictable. It doesn't have any of the, doesn't have any oils, vitamins, and minerals in it to mess up with your... Uh, what's what's left the starch and protein that's that's primarily left in a uh, refined flour yeah so it's much more predictable and the more whole grain you get the more uh more things can happen yeah yeah <laughs> but there's more food too and more flavor sounds like quite a challenge to yeah. keep, keep your product uh consistent yep yeah. and and the good thing about farmers markets is you're dealing directly with the customer mm -hmm. so if you get a not quite perfect loaf of bread. You're there to say, "Well, it looks funny today, but it still tastes great." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm sure people are much more understanding when you can have that. They really do. They really are. Interaction. Um, and we've always sold um, a, a bread that's a day old or two days old sometimes. And people, we said, "This is day old." They said, "Great, it's fine." Of course, sourdough is fine. It keeps for about a week. Yeah. So, um, and in the rye breads, the flour just the flavor just gets better. Mm -hmm. So. So we do rye, we do a mix, mixes of whole grains and all kinds of inclusions, nuts, fruits, seeds, um, and other wild stuff, um, whatever our imaginations um, can think of. And as you implied, um, we have some specialties that we only do once in a while, mm. and we have our, our regular things. Are those specialties rotational, like you'll, from every year you have a different batch of specialties? You mean do we come up with new ones all the time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. some. Your creativity. Uh, well, now that we're with brick and mortar bit. with more staff, yeah. there's way more ideas coming. Couldn't we do this and should we try that? Right. So this this gets back to our core mission. You know, if we're doing whole grain, organic sourdough, mm -hmm. how f how far does that go? If you can do something really cool with just white flour, mm -hmm. do we go with a refined, uh, refined bread just because we want to make that thing? Mm -hmm. Or do we put a little, you know, put a little leash on it and say, back off, <laughs> too much white flour. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm I'm really, uh, I know the, the ease of baking with refined flour. Yeah. But um, the reason, I learned, the reason um, when you buy an enriched, a white flour, it's usually enriched, has vitamins added back into it. And um, that's because all the white flour that happened in the early 20th century led to malnutrition because people were only eating white bread mm -hmm. and lots of it and white noodles and, um, and uh, white products. And, and people were not getting their vitamins and minerals because mm -hmm. they'd been removed from the grain. So I don't want to go there again. Sure. <laughs> yeah. um, not when we have this really great grain available to us. Yeah. And I'm curious about the, you mentioned, you know, the seeds and the berries and the other things you add. Where do you source those from? Um, as I said, everything is organic. Yeah. So that's the first bar. So uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, Hummingbird Wholesale out of Eugene is our main uh, organic provider. So we limit ourselves sort of to what they have. Okay. Um, I don't tend to use tropical fruit. We stick with, we have a lot of California-grown organics, uh, particularly in the nuts. Mm -hmm. um, and since we insist on certified organic, we get into that conversation of, well, is it better to go local or better to go organic? Because mm -hmm. I could get local walnuts, 
but there, as far as I know, there's no certified organic walnut growers that I can easily access. Because then we can talk about access. How do I get those? Of course. Right? Yeah. Now, there are local, lots of local organic growers here for fruit, um, strawberries, and uh, I get directly. Uh, last year, I got them directly from Alice Fairfield in South Corvallis. Okay. Blueberries, we get from Berkey's Blueberries in Lebanon. Mm-hmm. Um, apples and um, uh, things like spinach and sometimes garlic um, my, and squash, pumpkin, broccoli, cheese. Those are all provided by people right here in Cavallas. Wow. Now, the local cheese isn't organic, but sometimes we choose the local cheese instead of the organic in order to support local. Yeah. But we have certified organic farms here, and they've been big providers of those inclusions. Yeah. So. How difficult was it building relationships with these local farms and suppliers? They're at market and we're at market, so yeah. we get to know them, yeah. Yeah. And uh, sometimes we get really great wholesale deals from them yeah. because they have – Extra product, they really, you know, there's not going out of market. It's not going in their CSA. They got too many, and they love us to have some. <laughs> sure. Was there a big evolution from before, like at those very early days when you're just baking at home and doing like uh, well, market stuff? Well, before we could order enough things, because uh, wholesaler suppliers have minimums. Minimums, of course, yeah. Um, we would just buy at the co-op, yeah. and we paid retail for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then we got – when we began to get uh, big enough to have grain delivered by uh, Green Willow to our door, we were then – we started ordering from Hummingbird. And we'd get an order once every month maybe mm. to reach their $400 minimum. Now, a box – a 25-pound box of walnuts is $250, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but we used to get five-pound bags of walnuts because Hummingbird serves the smaller providers. So we could get a five-pound bag and then – Pretty soon we needed two five-pound bags. And then we said, well, let's just get the 25-pound box. Sure, you're scaling, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, scaling up. But I then I started to learn about you have your distributor who comes every week so you don't have to have the warehouse, right, which is great until they run out. But uh, Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have a couple other providers now. Um, dairy has always been a challenge. Getting uh, We don't use much milk. We use a lot of butter. Um, and organic butter – is tricky. Um, we used to get that from a dairy in Malala, and they had so much trouble sourcing organic milk, they stopped producing the organic butter. So we had to scramble around until we could figure out where we could get it from. And we've changed um, sources a couple of times. But our relationship with the co-op has grown mm. um, over the years. Of course, we've been selling there, but they have created a number of years ago business accounts for small for about six or seven of us that have uh, are too small to use the big distributors mm-hmm. and they act as our whole intermediary oh, so they will order like they will order for you a 25 pound bag of beans they'll order us a 25 pound bag of beans or a case of butter yeah and then we get a, a discounted price right. um, as a you know as a business account and um uh, and then also when we when we when we couldn't find butter, um, they helped us out cases of eggs in this last year because we're just in between, you know, being able to get three hundred dollars worth of eggs, you know. Yeah. And then gradually we're we're beginning to find uh, more sources. Um, the the trick is is how do we stay locally focused and yet the distributors get further and further away? That's right. that's the real challenge. We try to keep that focus. But sometimes we have to use the bigger distributors, and the co-op uses some of those bigger distributors. Yeah. So it, it's keeping locally focused. It, the system isn't built for that. No, of course not. The system's not built for that. Yeah. We were very fortunate with Green Willow that they would deliver us just a few bags of flour in their, in their van once a week because mm-hmm. that's what we needed when we started. And now we get a pallet from Hummingbird. Or half a pallet. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot. We get to know our drivers and, you know, it's it's yeah. really it's really fun. But there's a lot of shuffling behind the scenes to make that loaf of bread show yeah. up consistently. Well, if we run yeah. out of the flour that we make that bread with, there isn't any bread. Right. People who are, have grocery store uh, approach to food don't understand how hard the grocery store is working to keep the shelves stocked. It's, it's a huge challenge to keep yeah. people fed. Yeah. And during the pandemic, people saw what happened when... They couldn't keep the shelves stocked. 
Right. You know, how many days do you run out of the toilet paper or the flour or the whatever? That was an unfortunate, like, great peek behind the curtain of I, what it actually entailed. I think it woke people up. Because yeah. most of us privileged people had heard stories about that happening in other countries. Yeah. It rarely happened here. But it's very much in that vein of, like, that is not an American problem until that. But it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and every... Every producer has that problem all the time. I of course, mean, but we, we don't see it as Every consumer. week we have to order that flour so we can make that bread. But the consumer doesn't typically see it is what, no. I, what I'm saying. Yeah, no. but it, it exists as an issue. Yeah. Just <laughs> well, it's, the, it's not an issue for us except it's a bit business practice for us. If we don't do our ordering right, then we have a business problem, right? Right, of course. So even if the flour is sitting at the warehouse, if we forget to get enough. We have had the wrong kind of flour delivered. That's always a challenge. So. Mm. No, <laughs> your warehouse people pick the wrong flower. There's nothing you ever deal with usually at home. Right, of course. Unless you go to the store and they don't have the, your favorite thing isn't on the shelf this week. It'll be there next week. Gotcha. Well, it sounds like quite a quite a path that you've you've had over the past ten years. It's it's been interesting. Yeah. Um, in our early years, we would always visit bakeries in other cities, and we remember going to Astoria and talking to the folks at the Blue Scorcher. And the baker said, yeah, I really like to go back to just six tables and three people. And we said, ha, ha, ha. And now we're like, yeah. <laughs> it was easier when there were only six people. It was easier when there were two. Mm -hmm. But it's a different animal. You really accept that it's a different kind of business when you're at the size we are. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that's happening in terms of the number of staff, the better we get, the more skilled our staff gets, it actually takes fewer people because they're more efficient and uh, the whole operation becomes more efficient over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have somebody who's out this is out for two weeks and we're going to be okay with a person who's nearly full-time being gone because so many people can move in to the jobs that that person usually covers. Gotcha. So that's a sign of growth and development. Mm -hmm. We received a ten thousand uh, dollar grant from the city and county who are finishing dispersing their COVID money, mm -hmm. and we were able to make a case for how COVID impacted us. And uh, we're using a little bit of that money to send uh, Baker and our production manager to uh, baking classes that they haven't gotten to take yet. Oh. So they'll be even more skilled and educated and pretty enthused. Yeah. About about. You know, we, we need a better knowledge base. You know, Craig and I cannot hold it ourselves. He did just go to a class, very excited about what he learned. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm just going on vacation. I'm not going to class. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a fun option. Yeah. So I, I kind of already asked you this, but like when you were starting in this, this mm -hmm. new endeavor of the bakery at a commercial level, did you foresee like the kind of stuff that you're talking about? Is this... I knew nothing about it. Yeah, this was, <laughs> yeah, unforeseen, and you just, like, kind of grow into the problems you have to solve, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, what we learn as, as we hire people, people know stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, you hire smart people, and they're smarter than I am sometimes, you know? And that's great. I always thought I was really smart, but, like, wow. That's a great solution to that, you know. Yeah. I, I had, and so that's just opening myself up to not being the only story on the block. I mean, it's going to take a team of really competent people, mm -hmm. um, and that's why we have to train each other. But we also have to get out of each other's way. Um, so I didn't know anything except the vaguest idea about wholesale distributors and. And how you ever, you know, keeping inventory. When I was a camp director, of course, we kept inventory. And we worked with Cisco, the big food distributor. And every week they brought us a lot of food. And But I wasn't directly in charge of that. My food service manager there did it. So I just took that for granted in a way. Sure. And uh, now, uh, now I'm in that seat having to be sure that I don't do the ordering anymore. That's been passed on to uh, my lead, Brett Baker. Um, to be sure he's got his flour and his walnuts and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and he places the order, and, and, and that's, it's still a lot of work, but it's, it's settling down into pretty good order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny because there's certain items we use that we only get from one place, you know, a single item from a single source. Uh -huh. Those are the tricky ones. 
Right. But yeah, this is bigger than than I could have imagined 10 years ago. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. You touched on this earlier, but it sounds like you're trying to, in the near, very near future, step out. I in am. Roles. Is that you stepping into retirement or is that you just... I'm calling it retirement. Okay. Um, at this point, it looks like I'll probably still be the owner, uh, co-owner. Mm-hmm. Um uh, we, my husband still has, has some years left. I think he's still really engaged in both dreaming up production. There's still things he wants to bake that we haven't gotten to. I'm going to be 70 and, uh, I committed to 10 years and there are other things I want to do. And there are things I don't want to do anymore. Sure. Um, uh, the bigger we got, the more stressful it's been. Um, Some of the stress changed when the bakery finally moved out of our home after nine years. That just happened the end of August um, 2022. We finally moved into our brick-and-mortar location. And the stress level was really intense as we learned to bake in the new space. And also as our staff kind of, we all sort of went through a shock period of this new space. And we had a big staff turnover right there uh, in the first two months. So it was really stressful. We were all working like double time yeah. and uh, growing. We had to hire people. And uh, um, it was the first time I experienced physical symptoms of stress in ways I had never before. And I said, hmm, maybe this isn't so healthy. <laughs> yeah. So then it just, and it was a lot of work. And I decided I wanted to work fewer hours than 10 a day. When it was in our home, we, we, it was always there, right? 6 a.m. Yeah. to 6 p.m. Yeah. We were working. The delineation between yeah. home life and working life was probably pretty. Yeah, it was a staircase. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Physical staircase. Yeah, yeah, we live in a very small condo, and uh, the bakery basically had taken over the the main floor, 500 square feet. Mm-hmm. 350 of it was solid bakery, left 150 feet for the couch and a lamp and a chair. Yeah. <laughs> but... um. But it was it was fun, but it became unsafe um, in there with people walking, six people working at the same time and hot pans being carried around the room like this, you know, and having to say hot pan, hot pan. And and, uh, you know, all people stepping over each other. Um, we still do, but there's more elbow room now to step over each other. Sure. And the equipment's way bigger. Instead of 12 loaves in our oven, we can bake 60. That's five times more at one one load, mm-hmm. uh, but I I um I'm feeling that I'm I've worked a lot and uh, I've done this bakery thing. I think I'm fairly satisfied with it. It's never perfect when you're on the backside of it and and trying to make trying to make it good. Um, but we got there to uh, coffee shop, pastry bakery, the wholesale side, the farmers market side. Um, all of that is just mostly joyful. It's a lot of work, I'm sure, but yeah. but the result is is mostly joyful. But it's been fulfilling. It's been fulfilling, um, because we live in in the intentional community at at Coho. Um, there are people and community responsibilities that I'd like to get back to that I used to have more time to do. Um, prior to starting the bread business, I worked half time half to three-quarter time, but I was always clear that I had free time and flexible time. Mm-hmm. Well, my time's flexible now, but very constrained. You know, I said, I want to make an appointment? Just give me a time. I'll tell you, I'll figure out how to come, mm-hmm. right? It's it's uh, not like I'm busy from nine to five and then I'm free. I'm busy all the time and I'll work you in, <laughs> right? That's not how, we, yeah. how we set this up. That's how this happened. Yes, exactly. So yeah. um, I guess I'm just tired of being busy. Uh, tired of tired of the work. I'm happy that uh, Craig is still happy. Uh, one of our joys is that we have a family who lives at Coho that has two young children, and we are their local grandparents. Um, their other grandparents live uh, in Mauritius and in Australia, so they don't see them much. Yeah. And uh, we are the grandparents in you know the local. And that's a real joy to be able to do that. Our, we do have two daughters, Craig and I, and they are around 40. One lives in Boston and one lives in Honduras. They're unmarried. We don't see any grandchildren there, <laughs> at least 
not yet. And uh, we've got these two little ones uh, that are right next to us. And so we then our one daughter says, so that means I'm an aunt, right? And I said, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so and so it's really, it, that's a real fun joy. Um, my closing question would be, what advice would you have for anyone who's considering a boss's path of self-employment? I would always say, remember, there are other people out there that have been there that have done similar or even different things, but that you can bounce ideas off of. That's important for me. I'm, you know, I'm an extrovert. I'm a talker. I'm an idea person. And sometimes those ideas kind of are unformed. So I need, I need uh, sounding boards and I need to, to check in on, to see if I'm asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Use your local resources. I think the small business development center which is located at most community colleges uh, or somewhere in every county, I think. Um, really helpful. Um, yeah. Again, it's business people teaching business people. Um, in our classes, they brought in folks from the community who were experts in particular areas. And my thought was, oh, so now this insurance agent is going to talk to us, so now we're probably going to want to use them. Well, actually, yeah, maybe we do want to use them because um, – they brought in the best people, and the best people will tell you who you should be talking to if not them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not selfish about it. Yeah. Um, so that business mentoring was really important to us as people who had no business background, direct business background. Yeah. Um, you have to have an idea. You have to have a vision. And I, we always have said that our business plan was to grow slowly like our bread rises. Um, we did not raise a bunch of money and jump in with all of four feet. Um, we went very slow, and for us, that worked. Yeah. And then at, at certain moments, we got breaks. Mm -hmm. They always say, was it luck or, you know, did you, was it work? Well, it's always a combination of both. Sure. Um, when we were ready, when the co-op said, can you fill that shelf? And we were ready years later when the co-op said, Huh, can you fill the shelves? Because those two bakeries that pulled out were a significant portion. And we can't fill all the shelf. Yeah. You know, we don't have the same product. We don't have the same mission. So we'll do what we do as well as we can. Um, and that's that's a key. Do what do what you do as well as you can and you know, do what you like to do. Try to preserve some passion in it. Um, have good partners. And don't be afraid to stretch yourself a little bit. We find ourselves, when we started hiring people, we, always, we still say, we're probably in ruts. We're probably in some ruts. We've been doing this. Help us see where the problems are, where we're stuck. Give us your ideas. We can't always do all the ideas, but you have to listen to other people who, who can let you know if you're getting off track or if you're stuck. Yeah. Um, and it's hard sometimes to get that feedback from people. There's criticisms like, oh, you know, this isn't working very well. Okay. <laughs> what do you suggest? I don't know. <laughs> That's not the most helpful. But, but again, surround yourself with, more, with people that are different than you and people that you can also talk with. Sure. Yeah. And be open to their, yeah. what they have to say. From our church um, leadership training background, we have – gained, and these are available anywhere, a number of leadership tools and um, personality assessment and skill assessment and task assessment tools mm -hmm. that have been helpful to see where our team has strengths and where there might be some weaknesses. So it was like, we don't have anybody who really likes to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem here? Are we missing somebody on our team that would help us work more smoothly or more robustly? So um, yeah. using some any almost any tool like that will help a team get a better sense of where they're at. Yeah. Um, I don't spend a lot of time there, but for me, it's like a, a snapshot into how we're doing. Gotcha. We learned when we started this business that the majority of entrepreneurs in this country are over 60. So we felt right at home as we as we got there. Um, so don't let age stop you. Um, but. I believe energy is slowing Craig and I down. I mean, yeah. we aren't, we not, our brains don't work quite as fast as they used to. And that's why we let younger brains who are still on really fast 
yeah. take some of it. Um, and do look for, figure out what you really want in, when you come to employing other people, figure out what's really important to you in the qualities of the people you hire. Yeah. Um, I, again, that was a surprise to me, you know. Um, the kind of person you need is more about how they think rather than what they can do. What kind of what, what kind of approach do they take to problem solving or to doing a task? Um, and in the bakery, there's so it's very complex. You know, you're not just putting water in flour all day long. You're doing many many things. Everybody does many things, and so you need people that can see kind of the process and understand the process. Or if they don't need to see the whole process, they can do their small part very well mm-hmm. without disregarding. Right. Where, where it's coming from, where it's coming from. Yeah. I will be honest to say that we're lucky because we have, having, having had previous jobs, we have financial support from those jobs. Mm-hmm. We are not living on our bakery's income. Um, what we hope to do in the next few years is to get it to a point where the owners can live on the income. So uh, that's a little bit special for us that we could do it without um, much financial risk. Mm-hmm. When we started, it, the income was more important than it is now, yeah. but we're able we're able to see better now how we're doing financially. Actually, because it's a little bigger, it's easier to, to see how the money's flowing. Yeah. The bigger numbers, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So um, so that's been a little bit of a challenge. I think that's also why people over 60 are entrepreneurs because maybe they have a pension from here. Um, we don't have big pensions. They're little. But but we also don't, we also don't have big expenses. We've always lived modestly. Mm-hmm. And um, that that seems to work for us. Our house at Coho is the first house we've ever owned. Mm-hmm. So... Um, that's all part of our l- later in life journey is to own a home and to own a business. Yeah. Pretty crazy stuff. Yeah. It's very interesting <laughs> stuff. Yeah. 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 Well, I really appreciate you uh, sharing your words of wisdom and, and your story. Yeah. And, uh, well, thank you. Yeah. It's been a really great conversation. Okay. Well, we'll end it there. All right. And there you have it. This has been a great conversation with April, listening to everything she has to say and her experiences. Uh, If you want to hear more conversations like this, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and uh, look out for new episodes coming out soon. Until then, this has been Apostles Path. Catch you next time. (laughs) 